Hello, my name is Jorb. I love gear. I recently came into possession of a synthesizer that I think is kind of special. You may have seen a video from a certain Look Mom No Computer where he talks about the Korg MS-10 and he mentions that uh, he has one for spares and repairs that he's going to auction off uh, and he's going to donate the money to Red Cross. And I've had this idea in my head about comparing a bunch of vintage one oscillator, one envelope monosynths. I've got an SH-101, I'm halfway through fixing a kitten, and the MS-10 was the third thing I thought of, the third thing I wanted to get. So I've kind of been looking for a good deal anyway, but when this came up, I have so much respect for Sam, for Look Mom No Computer, uh, and the money went to a good cause. I figured, why don't I just go for it? And I'm kind of good at <laughs> winning eBay auctions. So I did. When it arrived, it looked like this. And now that I've spent some time fixing it, it looks like this. This video is just about repairing it, just about getting it into this state. Uh, but it will certainly be featured in other videos. I mentioned the one idea already. Maybe I'll do a classic Jorb demo overview. Uh, and I also want to modify it. But like I said, this video is just the repair. And if you've seen me fix things before, you know what I'm about to say. I really struggle with filming uh, and formatting repair content. But I still put it up because it's some of the stuff that's been the most useful to me in learning how to do these things. I would so much rather just focus on what I'm doing. Focus on fixing the thing instead of worrying about, you know, how to deliver a narrative, setting up for good camera shots. Uh, should I move my hand so you can see me solder? <laughs> All that shit. For, for me, any given repair happens over several days, sometimes with weeks in between uh, ordering parts or working on different projects. And I don't really even have the right camera setup or enough storage <laughs> to just leave it filming the whole time I work, uh, let alone editing something like that. Even when I just turn the camera on, when I think I've got something that I want to show people, I'm still now digging through like four hours of footage for a video I want to cut down to less than 30 Anyway, so the format I've settled on, you've seen me do this before, I'm going to sit here and talk to you guys. The pacing of the video is going to be defined by this, <laughs> by me right now talking to you. And I'm going to step through one problem at a time. Here's something that's not working, here's how I fixed it. Even if the footage isn't perfect, I'm still, still going to talk about what I did because that's my priority here, talking through solving these problems. And I think that's the, the right balance between like telling you a story, like, like going through my own experience and teaching you things that might be applicable to uh, a problem or repair you're trying to get through on your own. I think that's what works for me. I hope that works for you. Cool. Okay. <laughs> if I'm editing this the way I plan to, uh, next to me should be footage of uh, the unboxing that uh, Sam described as not pretty, but it will bounce, <laughs> which I thought was perfect. Uh, it was so plainly addressed to Jorb USA. It's all it needed, and it still <laughs> made it to me. Uh, yeah, it took kind of a long time getting here. It got hung up in customs, and it was in a UK warehouse forever. I had to call the shipping provider, and it was kind of a nightmare. Sam was super helpful, and for, well, he was kind enough in the first place to let me pay for extra shipping to the US when I don't think he was planning on that, so thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate the opportunity to have this. Uh, anyway, it finally showed up, and the first time I saw it, it looked worse than I thought it would, but it looks way worse than it is. Especially the keys, it looks like jagged teeth, right? They just need to be popped back into place. But other than that, it's pretty much as described. The sides were a little more beat up than I expected, but nothing I can't fix, right? So the first thing I have to do, this is not set up to work on US power. It has a UK power plug and it's expecting 240 volts. So I could use, they make external transformers. So it'll plug into a US wall outlet and have, you know, like a female outlet for whatever, UK power in this case. I, I don't love those. It's an extra step in some cases, you know what I mean? We're converting 120 up to 240, back down to whatever it needs to be in the synthesizer. So it feels like an additional step and it's not a permanent solution and I wanted this to be a permanent solution. And first, a huge disclaimer, I'm not super qualified <laughs> to be doing this. I'm just bold or stupid enough <laughs> to try things. And mains power is no joke and you can really really hurt yourself so make sure you know what you're doing make sure you're taking all the precautions you can to not hurt yourself and if you do it's not my fault <laughs> okay so first we got to do two things we need to replace the power plug of course so i can physically plug it in uh to do that i clipped the existing cord left the internal wires as long as i could because i'm still going to reuse those and then I dremeled from that hole out to like a rectangle because I have these snap-in IEC receptacles, which are pretty easy to use. They're my, they're my favorite for stuff like this. Uh, but it took a little bit of trying and cutting and recutting, pushing the edges a little further, grinding them down so that they weren't too thick for the snaps of the IEC to fit in. But it happened pretty quick. I used less than one cutting wheel and then a grinding tool for only a few minutes.
<laughs> Ta-da! That sucker's in there. Thanks. All right. Nice. Would you guys? Was that a horrible angle to watch all that? Great, easy. I'm not going to wire that up until I figured out the transformer. So super quick lightning round. A transformer takes a voltage and changes it to another voltage. <laughs> in consumer electronics, especially in synthesizers, that's going to be mains power for whatever your region is down to probably something a lot lower. For this, it's from 120 in the primary wide down to 36, but 18 volts positive and 18 volts negative on the secondary wide because 18 volts is way more useful and safer for running things like integrated circuits or logic chips or, you know, moving around control voltages, things like that. Anyway, the KA680 is the model of the transformer uh, in the MS10, and it does have taps for other voltages. So the what it's configured with right now, 240 volts, there's also a wire halfway through that wind, if you want to think of it that way, for 100 volts and one for 220 volts. So if I was in a region that used 100, 220, or 240, I would just need to make sure the outlet is something I could physically fit into my wall, which might be modifications, and then removing the current tap and soldering in one of the other ones. So we're solving our two problems there, right? We can plug into the wall and we're expecting the right voltage. Because US power is 120 volts and there's not a tap for that, I need to get a totally new transformer. So if an MS-10 was sold in the States, there are probably transformers that were originally used for it around. I don't care for it to be original or not, and lucky for us, there's just a ton of space in the back of the MS-10, so we can get transformers that are different sizes than the one that was originally in there. And there's only one uh, voltage at the output. I say one voltage. It's 36 volts with a center tap, so positive and negative, 18 volts AC. Uh, but some synthesizers would have, you know, 12 and 6 and 18 and that might make it harder to find a suitable replacement transformer, especially like an equivalent one, right? And not just one that would have originally been in there. But since this is one primary to one secondary, very, very easy to find replacements. So for $20, uh, enter this $20 monster. <laughs> Clearly bigger than the original, but like I said, it'll fit. Uh, to get it in there, I just measured on the back with painter's tape, marked where I had to drill a second hole, drilled the second hole. Paintbrush through the bottom hole, and you see the bottom hole is like an oval. So when I stick the paintbrush in there, it's going to be all the way to the top in the bottom hole here. Okay, get that properly against the wall there. And so since we're all the way to the top of the bottom one, I'm going to mark all the way to the top of the top one. There we are. Can you see that? What a beauty. I use the original mounting hardware as well. And then to solder everything in, uh, I guess before I did that, I clipped off the three pin connector from the old transformer, which was the, you know, the, the positive negative 18 and, and a center tap of ground. And I used those wires. I just soldered those wires so I didn't have to get or terminate a new clip. These aren't called Molex. I think it's Tamiya. I think they're called Tamiya clips. I'm not totally sure if that's right. But um, if you are working on an MS-10 and you don't want to mess with that or you need to replace it for some other reason, Tamiya connectors, three-pole Tamiya connector will get you there. Anyway, I soldered in the IEC uh, and used heat shrink, of course, and soldered up the transformer everywhere it needed to be. So when we're all done with the transformer in the IEC, we have the earth wire from the IEC to the chassis of the synth, which is good, the neutral from the IEC, it goes to a pin on a turret board, but the only place that goes is to one side of the primary wind on the transformer. And then the hot or the live is going from the IEC into a fuse and then into a switch and then into the transformer. So when we're off, the only thing that's connected is the ground, which is good. When we're on, it's going all the way into the transformer. And so at that point, it comes out of the output, which is those three uh, pins on the Tamiya connector I showed you earlier. And then, and again, another safety mention, the fuse is on the live path for a reason. When the current gets too high for whatever reason, a short circuit uh, or a surge or whatever, that's the one you want to break. I'm not an expert, and if I said that in a weird way, I, to you experts, I do apologize. But all I really want to get across is, and the way I understand it, that yes, alternating current, you know, in theory, you could swap them, but it's important to make sure you keep them the same. Because which one is live is important. Because where you put the fuse is important. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to leave that all in. <laughs>
that's US power uh, all sorted. So here's a short clip of the first time I plugged it in, the first time I tested it. Okay, this is going to be, okay, that plugged in kind of hard. I'm gonna turn it on, there it is, the LED down there. Okay. Okay, that's good. That's really good. Signal out. Plugged in. Did you hear anything yet? <laughs> Whoop. The volume pot's super dirty. Mm -hmm. This whole bastard super dirty. Nice. Not exactly where we need. You can you can hear the output jack is really, really dirty, and the envelope generator isn't exactly doing what we need it to. But uh, we have a few problems we know about thanks to Sam telling us about those problems. The first thing, there was a seized potentiometer, LFO to uh, frequency or LFO to, to the pitch of the VCO. And the whole synth is basically one board, and it's mounted with the nuts keeping the potentiometers on. So taking off that main board... That's as easy as it was to uh, dislodge that. And I think there was three or four uh, cables connected to the back. So dislodging those, taking it out, finding the right potentiometer. It was 100K logarithmic, and I only had 100K linear. And it was pretty short, um, like panel mount terminals. So to solve those two incompatibility differences, first physically getting it to fit, <laughs> it just needs the leg snipped uh, down to size. I think I snipped them sharper than you see in the video or, or after you see in the footage and they soldered in no problem. Uh, but onto the taper. And if you don't understand the taper, when I say linear taper, that means no matter where you are on the knob, the beginning or the end, one degree of rotation will result in the same amount of resistance change or value change. Okay, And if it was logarithmic, early on in the pot, one degree of movement is a lot less change in value, a lot less change in resistance than the end of the pot. And what that means is you have finer control over lower values. That's important for volumes and pitches and things, but it's the right thing to use in the circuit for this, because that's what was originally there. And a trick I've held on to all the way back to working on guitars. <laughs> a linear pot can have its taper modified with a single resistor. So you put a resistor between, I guess, the zero position, if you want to think of it that way, counterclockwise, and the wiper. And the rule of thumb I remember from working on guitars is one-fifth of the total value of the pot. So I got the resistor I had that was closest to uh, 20K ohms because it's 100K ohm potentiometer, wired it in, and it helped a little bit. I think I could go further. I don't remember if that one-fifth rule was specific to guitars or tone suck or something, but anyway, yes, you can modify <laughs> the taper of a potentiometer. Yes, the taper of a potentiometer is important for control purposes. It's, I, even now, after adding the resistor, it's kind of hard to get that to rest at like a really low pitch modulation. That might be kind of close to what it was like from the factory, but I think next time I open it up, I'm just gonna try a higher value resistor and, and see if that makes it any better for me.
Can you see me actively battling the sun <laughs> coming in and out from behind the clouds? Uh, anyway, precision or not, that's our seized pot replaced and now performing. Next, the envelope generator is acting weird. And we knew it would from Sam. He told us it would. Uh, and he said that he was experimenting with a Van de Graaff generator and damaged some of the uh, op amps around the envelope. Okay. I have most of them on hand. I, I ordered some special before they got before this got here. I don't think I got great footage of this, and I'm also going to talk about it really quickly, but when I desolder, it is flux and one of the plastic desoldering pumps. It works great for me. Clean out the holes afterward, and I always replace integrated circuits with sockets. So if I put in the replacements and I want to go back to test something or I change my mind about what I put in there or I got it wrong, I just have to pull it out and put it back in. I don't have to desolder again. Uh, but I replaced the ICs, and I had one of the logic chips. I don't remember exactly what it was, actually. It might have been a quad inverter, but it was it was part of the envelope circuit as well. And so I just replaced the ones I had, closed it all up, and that didn't seem to solve my problem. So the envelope was still acting weird, and what I think I realized, it was caught in some state between on and off. It was either like the trigger was never ending, or the trigger was not all the way getting there. Not totally sure, not totally sure if I described that well. But I started testing, okay, can I get the trigger out to result in anything? Uh, the MS-10 uses an S trigger, a shorting trigger. So I should be able to check with the continuity meter when those are connected or when one's connected to ground. And I wasn't getting that when I plugged into the top panel. So I looked at the circuit, and I'm going to try and highlight this <laughs> and show you, but it turns out that the trigger in jack is a switching jack. And so... What that means is when there's nothing plugged in, trigger out is hardwired or normaled to trigger in. And when you plug something into trigger in, it disconnects that. So I looked at that jack, and it was really, really corroded. So I hit it with some contact cleaner from behind and worked a jack in and out a bunch. And lo and behold... <laughs> So the envelope's working now. I don't know if it was just the dirty jack or if it was the dirty jack plus changing the ICs. It, it very well may have been. Those are pretty much the only problems with, you know, the actual sound generation, the actual synthesis. And it, it was great that I got them fixed um, already. So if I had a suitable replacement jack for the trigger in, if I had a switched mono quarter inch, I would have put it in there. I, I don't have any on hand. Next time I do an order from Mauser, I'll pick one up just to make sure because that's mission critical. If that doesn't work, then you can't play the synth, right? And even if I can get it to work well enough, if I just clean it, that's something that you might as well replace. Again, just a couple bucks. Great. Um, at this point, I also, because the soldering iron was hot, out and hot and I was messing with jacks, I replaced the main output jack. So I didn't have to, like, you know, spin the jack around or get it in the right spot to make sure connection was good. Uh, and it's apart from the other ones enough that I could use something that wasn't exactly the same shape that was a little bigger. So I have some from... So I have some from working on guitar pedals or guitars. And I just quickly soldered that in. Fits great. Didn't need to modify anything else. And that solved, you know, the issue of the bad connection at the main output jack. Great. Only really two things, and one of them's really, really small. <laughs> the very highest note had one of the, like, hooks or the tabs broken that it, like, levers on, that it, like, canters on. And... Uh, I didn't want to buy a whole new key, and so I thought, what can I do to replace just that part? And I have, I hold on to like little tins from candy or whatever <laughs> to use as containers when I'm working on projects, or sometimes I tear them up for scrap metal, and that's what I did. I, I clipped out just the right shape and glued it to the side of that key, just 
while it was in circuit and everything. Quick, easy, cheap, and it totally works. And especially lucky because this was the furthest right key for this out to the side, you know what I'm saying? I didn't need to worry about, you know, sanding it down to get it uh, exactly in line. So I didn't rub against the key next to it. I had enough clearance that I could just stick this on the side. So that was great. Another problem solved with something that was pretty straightforward, which is great. Very exciting for me. Okay, one big thing, the wooden sides. The existing side panels were in horrible shape. <laughs> they were totally fucked. They weren't going to hold anything together. And I have enough woodworking ability to make the shape of these sides. <laughs> Just barely. <laughs> but I didn't film most of it because I'm not super confident in my woodworking at all. And I'm for sure not confident enough to have people nitpicking the footage. <laughs> Uh, let alone, like I said, about repositioning and, and worrying about getting a good shot. I really don't want to do that when I'm messing with power tools that can cut off parts of my finger. <laughs> so uh, I took pictures at every step of the way, but I didn't want to film. It really would distract me, and I, I didn't want to make this any less safe. <laughs> I, just, I just don't need that. Uh, and really, I don't think my woodworking choices should be used as advice or recommendations for everybody. <laughs> okay, but I'm going to tell you what I did. Um, First, I have one, I got one board of oak, like pretty nice, uh, to use for side panels for synthesizers. That's what's in the kitten right now. And now this. Um, so you'll see, you know, pencil drawings. I just made the outlines of it. Uh, but take advantage of as many existing right angles as you can. That's something that makes woodworking easier for me. <laughs> take advantage of the right angles you're given. Uh, anyway, I have a miter saw. That's a hand-me-down from my father. Uh, and I cut the angles I could first on that, and I made sure to jut in between the pieces enough that I could get that. I have this horrible, horrible bandsaw, <laughs> and I made sure to get the cuts from the miter saw far enough in between them that I had plenty of clearance to use the bandsaw, even if I did, you know, waver all around and separate the two parts. But did that, I cut the rest of the outline of the shapes on the bandsaw. Uh, I have a palm sander. I sanded all the edges down with a palm sander. I use Danish oil to finish, which I've used for a few things for a while. Super quick, super easy. And while I was waiting for the uh, Danish oil to dry on the wood sides, I took the keyboard out and got all the dust out from the inside, which was kind of an incredible amount. <laughs> I wasn't even going to show this part because it's just taking the keyboard off and cleaning everything. There's kind of an extraordinary amount of dirt <laughs> down here. Much better. Some weird little streaky lines. You can kind of see like rust patterns and stuff. I think that's rust patterns. And then the paint cracking like in waves. But uh, a little rusty here and there. But the dust is gone. I think now I know what it smells like in this museum is not obsolete. It smells like dust. <laughs> Uh, and then I lined up with one of the original side panels to drill all the holes, which I need a drill press. Not all of my screw holes are exactly lined up. There was bending and, and shaving out the insides of holes, and they aren't perfect angles, even if I had a jig. Just, I really need a drill press to get things going straighter. And don't tell me that I can get it straight with a drill. I don't want to hear anybody say that, because I can't. <laughs> uh, anyway, the holes I got all the holes drilled for the side panels. And then the left end cheek needs to have a bit routed out to fit the um, little bit for the mod wheel. And I have a router that I got at a pawn shop for working on guitars. And when I was drilling the hole to, uh, you know, I guess pilot the, the router or the route depth, I went straight through the side of the panel. And I'm super disappointed that I did that. I used tape to mark my depth and everything, but I was pushing it up and I didn't realize it. So right here at the final stretch, I made uh, a very noticeable mistake. I'm super embarrassed by it, but in the end, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't make a difference to the thing working at all. So I, I was going to fill it just with wood filler, but I think I'm going to think of something more fun than that. I think I'm going to cover it up with a pin or a coin or something. But anyway, I bet you guys want to see it all buttoned up. So here it is. But that's really it. It was a lot of opportunities to be resourceful, and that's the kind of project I really, really like. A few little things I still have to do. I, I could clean up. I left part of the Velcro on top because I just didn't want to deal with the adhesive yet. Um, I should replace all of the jacks. They've all got some amount of corrosion um, just to, you know, make all those things cleaner. I don't know if it's been recapped or not, but this will need that at some point. And I need to get little rubber feet <laughs> and cover my mistake, but... 
uh, that's really it. And, and just to remark on the MS-10 kind of quickly, uh, as an instrument, as a synthesizer, it's awesome. <laughs> it sounds good. The filter is beefy. The filter is really brash. And I and I didn't... I, I have that impression of the MS-20. I thought that was because of the two filters, and that might be where my impression comes from. But the Cork 35 filter that's in here sounds really, really, really cool. Uh, even if it is great as is, I have a few modifications I want to do. Part of that is just... It's a big open panel with space to drill new holes and put switches and more jacks. And there's so much room inside of the synth to add extra circuitry. It's just begging for modifications, and that really, really excites me. Plus, in a very literal way, I am taking inspiration from Look Mom No Computer and the way I want to interact with this thing. And if it works, it doesn't matter if it's pretty or not. So all those things, like, you know, kind of poetic, right? I don't want to get too sappy, but there's like a very visible, there's a very visible excitement uh, to all the things that he does, and that's something I really want to have myself. And the idea of modifying this feels in line with that school of thought. And the fact that it's, you know, not the neatest, or I just used the parts I had because it would work, that all feels like the right approach for this. So it, it feels very appropriate for this synth and the way I want to interact with it. So there you go. I hope this was interesting, helpful, or both. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Look Mom No Computer. I'm really, really excited to push this as far as I can. So thanks for watching. My name's Jorv. I love gear. Cheers and so long.